Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. My name is Ashley Giordano. I'm the senior editor of Overland Journal and Expedition Portal. And today we're doing a podcast from the field in beautiful and cold Alberta in the Rocky Mountains with Ference and Evelyn from Overland Site. Welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, here. thanks for having us. And a special thanks to Terran Designs for supporting this week's podcast. When you're buying the best for your rig, you might as well do the same for your wardrobe. Terran is the best outdoor apparel on the market and the sharpest looking as well. From their flagship lightweight traveler pants with built in bug repellency to their innovative fire resistant campfire puffy. You can pack lighter, stay fresh longer, and push the boundaries on adventure. Build your kit today at terrandesigns.com. That's T-E-R-E-N designs.com. Because you no longer have to look like you live out of your vehicle when you actually live out of your vehicle. Thanks again, Terran. Yeah. So excited. Yay! <laughs> yeah, as I mentioned yesterday, we were feeling like meeting celebrities. No! Now we're like overlanding legends. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. Um, I feel that way too, actually, because you guys have done, you've seen a lot of things and gone to a lot of places and all over the world. And so maybe just tell me how you got into overlanding. What was the beginning of it all? Okay, well, I guess it started with me. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we've, uh, well, I was, I was always into cars when I was a kid. I loved cars. And then I got into traveling in my 20s, I guess. Yeah. So this is combining the two. And when I, uh, with two of my friends, we decided to enter the Mongolia charity rally. We bought a, a pickup truck on eBay and then we just left from London, heading to Mongolia and Long story short, we didn't make it to Mongolia with the truck. We made it to Mongolia without the truck. But in by the time we got to Tajikistan, I, I really kind of fell in love with the whole thing. And I love the fact that I'm with my mates. We're going camping. We don't know where we're going to sleep. And we're off-roading. We're going through these sand dunes in Turkmenistan and meeting people that we would never meet as a like a tourist in a, in a regular sense of the world, uh, uh, meaning of the world. So, yeah, I just, after that trip, we met, and apparently that's all I was talking about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He kept talking about this Mongolian rally that he did with his two friends, and it uh, took... One of the friends is named Ashley, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the whole trip was five weeks for them, and I was thinking about, oh my God, how can you sit in a car for five weeks? I need to, you know, get out and do exercises and workouts and everything. And they just, you know, constantly driving on the road. And fans just told me, I cannot imagine how cool it is to follow just some tracks in the grass in Mongolia. And we should do that someday. So um, he kept talking about this dream and... Uh, we decided to quit our job in 2017, so we did. And we also bought a rooftop tent to our, or for our... But first we actually, so when we met, we didn't have our Prado. Yeah. But so when we were like going to buy a car, we needed a car. So I was like, okay, what can I, can, what can we buy that's going to be good for a future trip? We didn't have any plans at that point. Just like, okay, I know that at some point we're going to do this and... So what is the car that I can drive every day, but I can turn it into an overlander? And that's when we bought the Prado. And then like a couple of, yeah. a couple of years or maybe a year later, we like, yeah, let's right. buy a rooftop tent. Yeah, that's right. how it started. So in 2016, we bought the Prado. And in 2017, we decided to quit our job. We did in October and I did in October, first did in December. And we bought, bought a rooftop tent and we went to Scandinavia for two weeks uh, just to test how am I feeling. You well, that know? was before quitting the jobs, actually, yeah, yeah, yeah. in the summer, like a test trip kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, that was a test trip because before that I have never slept in a tent. <laughs> oh, wow. Not even a ground tent. Yeah, not wow. even in a ground tent. What was that experience like? 
I mean, it was so comfortable because that rooftop tent uh, was quite big with a sponge inside. It was so thick. With like a ma- mattress. A mattress, but basically it was a sponge. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a spongy mattress. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that was really comfortable for me. And also the weather was really good. And first we uh, camped in proper campsites. So we didn't do any wild camp in Scandinavia. So... It, I really enjoyed that trip, and on the way back, we just decided to go to Africa because we saw an advertisement, or sort of like an advertisement on Facebook, that uh, an amateur rally from Budapest is going to to Gambia. So we just decided, okay, let's do another test um, drive uh, before we do the Singaporean trip. Gotcha. And yeah. you are both originally from Hungary. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Yeah. And did you buy the Prado there or somewhere else? Yeah, in Hungary. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just, yeah. Right. Like it was like nine years old, perfect condition, first owner was really good. And then I actually wanted to do upgrades before we went to Africa. So I got some gear already. I got bought the anger fridge. I bought the rooftop tent. We, we got a few bits and pieces, camping stuff. But then I knew if we want to go to Singapore over six months or seven months or however long it was, and then also through the Sahara Desert and everything, I want more than a stock truck. So we brought it to a, a, a place in Austria where they just done all the work and mm-hmm. put like it's got a Australian suspension system now. It's got a snorkel. It's got the roof top, the roof rack. It's got the just the regular, the usual stuff. And we built also like a. a draw a system in the back with my dad just a diy we didn't buy didn't want to buy an off-the-shelf one we like built not bought kind of thing Mm -hmm. and so we built that actually we built two versions built one for africa and then we decided that was good that trip was actually good that's why we call it like a test trip it turned out to be a proper difficult trip actually because we thought oh yeah a month and a half in africa let's see let's try our equipment and then see if that's going to work for us driving from Europe to Singapore. It turned out to be not just a test trip. It was actually quite dif- <laughs> yeah. difficult. Uh, but then we learned a lot. We learned how to drive on sand dunes. We learned how to go through a river. We got, learned quite a bit. And, and which countries in Africa did you go to during that trip? So Morocco, Western Sahara, Mauritania, Senegal, and Gambia. And then on the way back, of course, as well. Yeah, five countries in total, yeah. But before that, we haven't done any overlanding trip, or I haven't done before any overlanding trip. At least not like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it was a good test uh, drive. So you used the Prado for your daily driver as well as an overland vehicle. Yep. What benefits did it have for both? Like, Uh, how did that work together for both things? Well, the first of all, we live in the middle of the city, so we we we, we were owning other cars as well. So like, I, I couldn't possibly justify another two cars. So we just had the one, and we had to make a compromise, I guess. So it was big enough for an overlander. We could even sleep inside, and the fact that it's not like a roof conversion. There is no pop top. There is no permanent um, changes in the truck, other than the suspension and the snorkel uh the sleeping platform inside or obviously the rooftop tent can be taken out the sleeping platform could be taken out so once we got home i could remove unbolt all these things like boxes from the roof and the rooftop tent and then it suddenly was a normal car okay it looked a lot better than a normal car because it was lifted and chunky tires and everything but still it was a a good daily driver still Okay, so you did this trip to Africa. What did you take away from that trip? Like, what did you learn in terms of about yourself or about Africa or the world that you didn't know going into the trip? Okay. Yeah, so I learned that we are so lucky just in general to live in a very developed country in the middle of Europe. So because we so many Africans dealing with water problems or or any kind of uh, problems, food problems and everything. So, and also we could easily cross any border with our European passports and the African people 
couldn't. So they were just, you know, gathering at the border. They, they tried to cross the border and they couldn't. So at that time, I just realized how lucky I am that I born in Hungary and I have the European passport and also that we can have access to, uh, to water, drinking water, for example. So, yeah, so it just told me that how lucky we are just in general and we don't have to, you know, always um, say that, ah. Oh. Complain well, about yeah, anything. Yeah, complain about everything, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you guys are so funny. You were telling me last night about Hungarians. Yeah. Just complain. Yeah, they it's complain. All the time. It's a Hungarian habit, actually. Yeah, sorry and to if, say that, but that's true. <laughs> if any Hungarians are listening, I don't care what you think. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Let's just be honest, yeah. <laughs> no, but we on a smaller scale of things, we also learn that we get cold very easily because <laughs> we slept in a rooftop tent and get ice outside and uh, just frozen and we were mm. cold a lot in Africa which, is, which was shocking right yeah but it was January to be fair January February going through the Atlas Mountains still we thought it's gonna be warmer than it was and uh, also another thing I have to admit that one of the factors why we went with this organized rally which I would never do again not with that kind of organization at least not not this I'm don't have any issues with the organization with that organization I just wouldn't go with 150 cars again because gotcha. that's how big it was and it was a rushed trip and it was too fast for I think we travel faster than regular overlanders anyway but it's not like we want to drive 20 hours a day so right. it was a bit overwhelming it was a lot of driving and a lot of distance and a lot of uh, I would say chaos in like trying to get from A to B Anyway, so I wouldn't do that again, but one of the reasons why we signed up to that rally was because we'd never been to Africa and we were like, okay, Northwest Africa, we don't know how it is there, let's go with other people. And this is like, this sounds fun, so let's do that. And when we plan a trip like, let's say this one, and we are going to go to South America or Mexico or places like that, and obviously our friends and family are asking us, like, how come you're going there? It's so dangerous and like, you're going to get killed or whatever, all that those kind of comments that many people get when they plan to trips, uh, plan trips to these uh, countries. And I'm kind of getting upset when I get those questions. I'm like, why do you think that you've never been there? You just hear the news and you think it's bad and uh, people shoot at, the, uh, you know, there's a lot of killings and whatever. But I, I was the same kind in a way when I planned my trip to, we planned our trip to Africa. like. We were comfortable, more comfortable to go with other people than alone. And we would have been fine, of course. Right. So. Yeah, because on the way back, we didn't have any issues because on the way back, we were alone, alone or yeah. almost alone. Yeah. And yeah, it was yeah. fine, of we, course. Yeah. And you guys, was it two weeks from Hungary down it to... It was about 16 days from yeah, 16 from days. Hungary to the Gambia. So it's, it's a lot of distance, like 8,000 kilometers or something. Whoa. And then on the way back, we took our time and then stopped in places where we wanted to. But otherwise, it's because it's a kind of a... That rally we're talking about, it's kind of a challenge to do. So you've got to be there. Your your truck has to be able to do it. Your, you have to be able to do it. But we were... So the... The advantage of that doing that rally was that we got to places we wouldn't we wouldn't be going like mm. because it went through some really sketchy areas actually where the military was guarding the the camp because uh, it would have been a target too many people from Europe in one place in the desert apparently uh, it would have been a target so we went far into the Sahara Desert as well in Mauritania so we wouldn't have done it alone. So things are for, for for those kind of things. It was a very good experience, and we met fantastic people on the trip. Mm. Nice. Yeah. How would you prepare for another rally if you're going to do one versus a longer term overland trip? Uh, I wouldn't do a rally. That's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> for so those I, w- folks I would. Out there that are want to do a rally. Yeah. Let's say. Okay. okay. All right. Actually, yeah. there was a guy from California who's done the same trip, than Mark, <laughs> and. Uh, he so there's there's a lot of things to consider because you either buy because it starts in Europe in Hungary but obviously once you're in Europe you can buy the truck or the the car that you want anywhere in Europe and then 
just use those plates and drive to Africa, sell it there if you want, or drive it back to Europe and sell it then. But then what Mark's done, he weighed the pros and cons of buying it locally in California, upgrade the truck in a way that he wanted to, buy everything, test it, go on to a four -wheel, like a four-wheel drive driving course, uh, things so he could do that with his own truck. And then he shipped it and then used the truck, sold it, in, or actually he gave it away in Africa to a charity. Uh, so one thing is the vehicle to consider. The second thing is whether you want to go to an, the other side of the planet and do a rally like this, or you want to do something like the Baja rallies, or you want, I'm sure there is rallies in Africa like that, or in, uh, in Asia as well like that. But um, it's fun because you meet a lot of like-minded people in a very short period of, time, period of time. So if you don't have time for uh, like a six month overland trip on your own, then these tend to be much shorter because most people doing this specific rally were on just a yearly vacation for two weeks because then you can do it, that you can fit it in. So that's, I guess that's another advantage of it. Mm -hmm. And you a can, lot of the rallies, the purpose of it is to leave a vehicle behind a in the lot of it would be yeah like the donate. like the mm -hmm. like the charity rally that i've attempted to do in 2014 and we didn't make it there but yeah that was the same kind of idea although for example compared to this rally to that one is like one of like the the african one was to all 150 cars going almost with the same pace every day checking in on like every stage kind of thing although there's different categories you might not need to check in but there's like the rally was going as a group together whereas with the london to mongolia charity rally was like you leave on one specific day if you want together and it's like there's like a ceremony and then you arrive in ulaanbaatar whenever you want so you take as long as you want any route you want whereas the, the african rally was like a set route gotcha uh, so what were the names of those rallies you participated so in? So the African was the Budapest Bamako rally, and the the London to Mongolia was the Buda, uh, the 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 Mongolia charity rally because there's the Mongol rally, but that's totally that's different. different. So this is a Mongolia charity rally. Gotcha. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, and of course, so we not only we were not only doing rallies, but we were doing our own little road trips and camping trips mm -hmm. as well, other than Scandinavia and these rallies. So right, we. We didn't just do these organized rallies. We've done. I've done a lot of road trips with friends. A lot, like in Europe, it's. I think Europe is fantastic to do road trips. Not necessarily, at least not the western part for off-roading or, or remote backcountry camping, because there are too many people for that in Europe. Uh, it's too crowded for that. Uh, but eastern part you can do it. Southern part, yeah. But. For road trips and maybe staying in organized campsites, yeah, that's, it's, it's beautiful. So you finished the Africa trip slash rally. Yep. And then you went back home yep. to prepare for the big... Not really. Oh, yeah. well, we, we went back home. We went back home for like a week. Yeah, for a week. But, uh, but after that, we flew, uh, flew to uh, Asia. Southeast Asia. Yeah, to Southeast the, Asia to Vietnam to um, spend a month there and also to Bali to spend okay. a month there. Bali. Yeah, yeah, so we've nice. spent yeah, a month in each in, in, in Saigon and in Bali and we just, you know, just spent two months in Asia and then we flew back. It... <laughs> So this is another thing I might, I wouldn't necessarily do again this way, sure. because we flew back from Asia. So we we spent like a, year, a month and a half in Africa, then two months in Asia, just flying there, and then we flew back to Europe and then started the trip. But that meant it was a very hectic preparation because we got back and like, okay, let's upgrade the drawer system, let's buy this, let's order that. It's not going to arrive. We can't buy that. So it's, <laughs> I wouldn't do it this way anymore. Okay. But we were like, okay, we have two months, we're not working, let's do something that doesn't involve sitting at home. So we flew to Asia. Nice. Yeah. It yeah. was fun, it was good. Yeah, what were the fun. highlights of the trip? You were backpacking, I imagine? We, we actually worked. Oh, you did? <laughs> yeah, we actually okay, yeah. worked online. So I was setting up the website. Uh, Evelyn was also starting her freelancer yeah, career, yeah, I guess. Yeah, exactly, yeah. I tried to build a web shop, um, a dropshipping web shop, 
but after that I just realized that how much I love the advertisement part of marketing so I specialize myself in Facebook uh, and Instagram advertising and also in Google advertising so after so yeah we went to Singapore and after Singapore we I just started to work as a freelancer basically but uh, the two months that we spent in Southeast Asia it was a very good time for me to learn a lot of things about online marketing so oh, interesting. I really appreciated that time and also we met amazing people there and we just you know you just get inspired by other people yeah because we stayed in this really cool co-working space we worked in a co-working space in Bali like you have a pool and the beach is like 200 meters away but you're working all day so we were thinking okay we're gonna spend this two months between the two trips africa trip and the asian trip with work we're trying to sort of establish ourselves working online but let's not do it in europe or budapest so we flew to asia and it was like so it sounds maybe it sounds a bit uh i don't know wonderful it <laughs> yes but it sounds a bit like oh that's just uh, a bit too extravagant to fly to Asia to work or something. It was actually cheaper to stay there for those two months than staying at home. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's a lifestyle. So digital nomads live in uh, Southeast Asia and work for from there. Yeah. It's just a very cool lifestyle. Nice. Yeah. Um, How did you transition from your full, what I imagine was a full-time job to being a freelancer? Yeah, so I always hated uh, <laughs> this nine to five job. Uh, so, but I really loved marketing, and I I was always working in online marketing. But uh, yeah, I hated this office, um, yeah, lifestyle. So I was really. Uh, relieved when we just decided okay let's quit our job and then i have a year to figure out what am i gonna do with my life and i was 26 or 27 by then so i was quite young so i just realized you're that, still young yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> but i ha i still have time to figure it out so yeah and southeast asia it just yeah it just happened you know when i realized that what am I gonna focus when we done with this Singapore trip and uh, when we got back home I was still a little bit confused and I went uh, to you know um, job interviews and when I stopped in the building I stepped in the building and in the office I looked around me and the people were so depressed and so you know exhausted and I just decided no I, I can't I can't do it anymore so I went back home after my first job interview I registered myself on Upwork because that's a freelancer platform and you can find jobs there and I was yeah just really focused to find a, an online job there so that's where I got my first client and the other clients just came by recommendations that's so powerful the word of mouth mm, like yeah. you have yeah. one client do a really really good job they will recommend you to a bunch of other people who will recommend yeah. you to other people and that's i think even with social media and email and all of that it seems like word of mouth is still super powerful yeah right. yeah. yeah and what were you doing so i'm originally Before? i'm a lawyer and i work for investment companies in london and i've done it remotely from budapest most of the time but i spent a lot of time in london as well before and I, I liked a lot of parts of my job, at least initially I used to, but I mostly liked the whole environment with like, I worked with very smart people. I worked with like challenging tasks and everything, but after a while it just got to be too difficult for, for what I like compared to what I want to do, like be outdoors, uh, you know, spend more time with travel. And, and this was like a very strict corporate environment that I didn't like anymore, even though I was very lucky to work remotely pre pandemic world, you know, right. I was working for like seven years from my own apartment and for a, for a, for a boss that was a thousand miles away. And there was again, 
still like it still got to a level and i'm like okay i went to mongolia with my mates i i know i want to get out of this job and finally we quit in 2017 but it's very hard so i guess i mean because i i don't dislike all of the parts of my job but it it gives me the opportunity to do this right now mm -hmm. it's very hard to get away from it um but i did three times but that means i went back three times yeah. <laughs> so uh and this is what's happening now like i i quit my well it's, it's not i say job and it's really a job but i also have my clients because i work as a consultant um and it also goes through recommendation and but it's just um a very official very strict world uh working for these big companies and and it's just I want this, like, you know, you look outside and there's a river there. It doesn't involve that. Uh, and and so what I'm trying to do is set up my own online business and, like, uh, maybe do my own things online as well. So I'm in the process of doing that. Uh, but chances are I will just go back and work for another, like, do another six-month project, maybe a 12-month project, and then we're off to the Antarctica again. I don't know. <laughs> you know, just... Uh, yeah, that's. I, I, I find that this is a very frequent question when you talk to people, especially yes. people who are not overlanding or not long term. Like, how can you afford it? How do you do it? And the main answer that we have usually is we don't buy stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't buy the latest phones. We don't buy new clothes. We don't buy new cars. We don't. We don't have uh, a car loan. Like, especially if somebody is asking, uh, who's paying for like a seven hundred dollar monthly car loan. And asking us like how can you do this how can you afford this i'm like there's your answer i mean but if that's your preference to drive a brand new truck but then not travel like you can't maybe you cannot have both some people can but sure. we wouldn't be able to pay for a car loan and a mortgage and everything else and then do this so we mm -hmm. we decided this is our preference yeah making a priority and then there are always sacrifices or decisions that you have to make yeah and it's just we, it as i said like we're driving the the same truck that it drove we drove to Singapore mm -hmm. a lot of people would would have bought to be fair I would have bought a separate if, with my mindset now I would have bought a separate truck for that trip right. and then sell it later so now looking back you said that you would actually in an ideal world prefer to have one purpose-built vehicle for overlanding and then a separate one for a daily driver what about that um, vehicle that was built for both do you oh. feel like should have been changed yeah um I still love that truck. I love that it's a it's the Toyota Land Cruiser 120 uh, Prado, and it's it's really great. It's a great truck, but and if you're doing like two weeks overland trips, maybe a weekend trip, maybe uh, like shorter trips, my answer would be still be the same as in like use your daily driver, put a rooftop tent on top, or sleep inside. Just do that. But if you're going on a six month plus long trip, have a purposely made overland truck because your life is going to be easier and better on the road like for example with the prado it was i wish we had like a pop top roof where we could have stood up inside and if the weather was bad we could have you know make a tea or you know uh, brush our teeth inside something like that we were always outside and the fact that we went through central asia and and the himalayas or part of the himalayas big mountain ranges, bad weather. If you're doing everything outside, it's not as comfortable if you just uh, have your daily driver with a rooftop tent. And also another thing is, even though it's a very capable capable truck, I would have probably bought a stronger one, uh, maybe higher lift or bigger tires, more recovery equipment. We, I think we were, again, this is a balance how much money you want to spend and how much weight you want to take. And I think weight is equally important as money in, in these terms. And uh, like a winch or high lift jack or things like that. If you have a small car, which the 120 Prado relatively is a small one, you got to decide whether you take a, a big tool that you may or may not need over a trip like that. So long trips have a purposely built one. Shorter trips, use a daily driver. Yeah, but also it was a good idea to show the people that you don't have fancy cars. So if you have a family car, you can just upgrade it, it and uh, go wherever you want for an overland trip. Yeah, so you don't yeah, you can do fancy cars or fancy vans. Or, but 
as you can see on the road, so it was a good opportunity to show the people that, that the fact that you can have a family car and you can upgrade it. So, yeah, and we actually in inspired my friends <laughs> who has a, who have a Toyota Corolla, is it? A yeah, Toyota like Corolla? a 15-year-old Corolla. <laughs> yes, a very small car. And, uh, yeah, financials inspired them with this drawer system in the back, so they built their own and they could sleep inside in that small car and they went to Croatia and also to Slovenia last year and also this year they're gonna do that again until they they find their I don't know dream van which is a, a transporter T4 or T3 I don't I can't remember that but yeah we just inspired our friends friends and it's so cool this content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. Speaking of inspiring and vans, so you guys did this trip um, from, was it Budapest, Budapest to, to Singapore, Singapore. Yep. Um, in the Prado, yep. and you learned a lot about that. And then you, like many, many other people that I've chatted with, had the experience in that vehicle, and then the inside living space for longer trips becomes more important. Yep. And so what did you choose and why? Um. We, I mean, my ideal dream truck was always the 70 series Troopy Land Cruiser. But then by the time we, so that would have been ideal for Budapest Singapore trip. And we met lots of really well built uh, 70 series on that trip. And I was like always just jealous. And, but then by the time we got back and we were thinking of, okay, how permanent are we going to work online and how long and all those kind of things. And for that, uh, a roof conversion, like a, a a pop top roof if that's that's how you call it right mm -hmm. those are just those are great but not enough not big enough for for permanent living inside which we had plans for so we wanted a 4x4 van we we wanted to stick with four wheel drive because that last part of the trip that you want to take to get to the most beautiful places you need four wheel drive or high ground clearance and all that so we're looking at all the options we were looking at what kind of vans can we buy what can we afford what is on the market and luckily in europe there is a, a maker a truck maker called iveco which what we're sitting in right now uh, which is a major brand it's not known in north america but it's a major truck maker in europe and they have this sprinter mercedes sprinter sized van uh, that they're making two diff locks low range gearbox four wheel drive high ground clearance everything that you need so we we're looking for that for two years because we weren't in a rush because then obviously covid hit and we were like okay let's let's do this let's find one but then covid made covid just made buying these vehicles more difficult because everybody found out about this kind of travel style and there was a couple of vans that we looked at. These are all used vans, obviously, uh, that we looked at, about 20 years old vans. Um, we looked at younger ones as well, but then the price just goes through the roof. And the there was like two or three that we were just not quick enough to buy because other people bought it. Uh, and this was, we're talking about a couple of days that they went up on a, on a, like an advertisement site. And then suddenly this came up. And, uh, and we just bought it without even seeing it. Just like transfer the money straight away, talk to the, the guy in Germany, <laughs> just like, can I send you the money now? And then I think the next day I sent it. Haven't even, I've obviously I've seen pictures and I've spoke to the owner, transfer the money, 
no negotiations, nothing. I'm like, how much are you asking? Yeah, here you go. And, uh, and then I think three weeks later, we drove there with my dad and picked it up. And then, so, of course, there was many that we didn't like. So many that we, by that time, we learned what we want. Like we want a table inside, we want to sleep inside, we want to be able to stand up inside, have a little sink and a fridge. Like that was like the kind of the basics that we wanted. And this has, this had everything of that and a bit more, like it had solar panels already. It had, uh, I don't know, um, a tougher suspension. So it was used for travel before you purchased yeah. it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the, the owner, like two owners prior to me, had built the truck and he was a mechanic who wanted to travel the world. And unfortunately he had a paragliding accident so he couldn't use a, manu- a standard anymore. He had to buy an automatic. So we had to sell this and sold it to the family whom I bought it from. And the family sold it because they had their second kid on the way. So it's too small for that. Right. And But I think the talking of the, the size of the van, it's perfect size because it's short wheel, short wheelbase, uh, very high ground clearance as a, like a, as a base. And, uh, and it's got the low range gearbox and the diff locks. So the engine is the weak point in a way that it's very, very, it's lacking power, like very much. <laughs> it's like 102 horsepower for a four ton vehicle. But then the, 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 the actual standard gearbox is, the, gear, the gears are set up in a way that it's compensating for the lack of power. Gotcha. Plus we have the low range, so it can go anywhere, but slowly and loudly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What would you change about it, or are you happy with pretty much ev- everything in we terms of? We changed a lot. We changed a okay. lot on it. Like the main build was there, and then we yeah. added a few bits. Like we changed the box on the front, we changed the LED light, we changed the, uh, I don't know, we set up our uh, Wi Fi kind of router, the inverter was like there was no inverter, so I have a, a really good quality inverter. Can we say brands? Now. Yeah, I mean, this is yeah. offline now, but yeah, can we? Yeah, of yeah. course. So it's a, uh, I've, I've got a, a Victron 800 watt inverter installed, and we made it, I think, a little bit nicer inside. Yeah, so I put this white foil so on the wrapped fur- it. Yeah, yeah, on the furniture, so it looks more modern. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also we changed these uh, the curtains. Drapes, yeah. yeah, and also the these cushion. the car- uh, cushions. Cushions. Yeah. Yeah. So with the, my dad helped a lot because he's yeah. like re- into DIY. He loves DIY, so he made the cushions, and he helped with various bits around where it's like, you know, hammering and using a screwdriver involved so right we've done a bit and also recovery we got all our recovery gear from arb and uh, we got a nice awning outside so these these little things little changes that we we just customized it for our needs but mm-hmm. the main build was there gotcha yeah it's very well laid out and this area the dinette folds down into a bed right exactly yeah exactly yeah. nice and under this um, sitting area, we have a lot of storage. So, yeah, it's just really comfortable. And I know that I mentioned you before in another interview that uh, I really like these boxes to organize everything. So we bought some boxes uh, in the IKEA, put our uh, clothes in it. And also we have some plastic organizers in that cupboard. So we could organize our food, our clothes, our gears, accessories, everything. So. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's quite And obviously we've been in bigger builds and nicer big expedition trucks and everything so we see how comfortable can a truck be. And then of course when we are here inside and we cannot go outside because of the weather or whatever or it's at, in the evening and we, we you know we are inside already and we sort of scramble around because the space is too small and but then you you kind of uh okay with the small space because we compare it to the Prado, like yeah. we would be outside now, we would be, or sitting in the tent, you know, yeah, like on yeah. the roof. So compared to that, this is luxury, really. And the Absolutely. fact that I can stand up is, is just a big yeah. fact. Nice. So I'm going to go back a little bit and I want to talk about your Budapest to Singapore trip. Um, which countries did you go through and how long was it? 
So it was six months total and we went through Romania, Bulgaria, uh, Turkey, Georgia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Russia again a bit, and uh, Mongolia, China, um, Laos, uh, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. <laughs> wow! <Yeah. laughs> a I lot of countries. No, no, so that was spot yeah, on. Okay. Yeah. That's great. What were your, I guess, strongest impressions about certain regions or places along the way on that trip? Because you saw a lot, obviously. Those are there's a lot of countries to go through. It's a lot of countries in six months as well. So yeah. uh, other than the Prado, I would change the length of the trip in terms of time. So it, it, it took probably a year would have been better for that distance. Mm, yeah. But like uh, I've been to Mongolia before the trip and I keep mentioning Mongolia to you guys, but it's a, it's a fantastic place for overlanders, I think. But I guess, I don't know you, but China was a huge, imp- like made a huge impression, especially that we were on the Western part, not the Eastern part. So we would we would say like less developed than the western part, but it was still yeah. massively developed. Like we came through cities, I came across cities with five six million people you'd never heard of. Wow! Or at least I haven't heard of. And yeah. and it's uh, like um, roads are really well built, uh, cities are massive, people are extremely nice, and food is is out oh, of this world. It's that just was so the good. Best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the food. Yeah. And you had to hire a guide. And you, sh- was it shared one or two guides with a couple of other uh, No, there was only one guide at the time. So we had okay. two guides, but uh, split into first two weeks and then the second, well, first three weeks and the second three weeks. It was 43 days in total. So you have to have a guide, yes, if you're driving through China with your own vehicle. And the guide is sitting in one of the vehicles, uh, which is sometimes ours. Sometimes uh, we, we were three cars in our convoy. And uh, super nice experience. The both of the guides were really nice, uh, Shang and Brenda, and uh, you know just. Uh, I mean, I guess you don't know what to expect when you go to a, a, a totally different culture, and somebody you've never met before is going to sit with you for thousands of miles or kilometers yeah, with you. Right. And it was fantastic. Like we could have a lot of questions we could ask. Like we. Yeah. We had a nice chat. We got to know them very well yeah. and uh, really great. And they speak very good English. Oh, yeah. yeah. What were some things that you learned about that country from the guide that you wouldn't have norm- you wouldn't oh, yeah, have been lot. able to learn? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, I mean... Almost everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you cannot communicate uh, with the people, you know, that because they don't speak English. You don't speak Chinese, obviously, so... Yeah, and you cannot communicate non-verbally because that's different there. So you need a guide. But we had a very nice experience. The people were so friendly with us. And uh, yeah, and we also got some presents from the people there. Yeah, because we tried to avoid the big cities. So we went through the rural area, but just parents mentioned, so the western part of China. And sometimes we just stopped at a small village, I mean, on the on a basket field, basketball field, and uh, the whole village just turned up, and they were watching us cooking our meals for dinner, and they were just asking, why don't they uh, eat rice for dinner, for example, because we were making Italian pasta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they were... Um, taking uh, some photos and videos of me, how I cut the onions, because that was so strange for them. I don't know, maybe they have another technique for that, but, but that was really yeah, the, interesting Yeah, the whole village them. turned up, like yeah. whole village and, uh, you know, like 50 mobile phones just turned, like pointed at us and <laughs> taking pictures and videos. And, yeah, we yeah. have a paparazzi photo of that, so yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, and I guess like everywhere you go as an overlander, you stand out because you tend to end up in small villages and uh, remote places. And I guess that's a little bit even um, more extreme in China because no overlanders go through really compared to the scale of the country Mm. and compared to how much it has to offer. But I guess this guide uh, requirement makes it difficult both financially and makes it more complicated as well. Or these people think it's complicated, but if you find the right company uh, to help you find the right guide, then it's not that difficult. You have to provide a lot of documents. Right. I was going to ask you, how did you find 
a good guide or guides? And then also, how did you link up with the other mm -hmm. two travelers or we, two vehicles? I'm not sure how many. Yeah, were three in. travelers mm -hmm. in two vehicles. And well, online, of course. So first of all, uh, Facebook groups like the Asia Overland Group, I think, or maybe the China Overland Group. I cannot remember one or the other. There were recommendations there before and also just Googling it. And then we made a, like a list of companies, uh, oh, sorry, a list in like an Excel sheet and then just, you know, put all the data into the Excel sheet. And then actually I didn't do that. Nils, who we were traveling with, was very organized and uh, has done it, uh, who just collected all the information we had. And we had like monthly calls with, oh yeah. So first of all, we hooked up with the, our future traveler partners also online through the Facebook group or yeah, through the Facebook group. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we started chatting, we created our own little Skype group and then started chatting who wants what. Only initially it was like five vehicles together and then two vehicles dropped off because of different timing or different preferences, I, I don't know now. But it was three cars eventually and we had monthly calls. And it took us about three months at least to decide which out of the six or seven companies we listed, which one to go for. And we were like the ones, we went for the ones that were one that seemed to be more accommodating than the others in terms of like we want a wild camp we want to go this route and that route and we want to do this this length price obviously was discovered uh, uh, considered and uh, and yeah this is how we decided we ended up with i think it's called adventure-china.com uh, and shang is is a really great guy he's uh, managing the company and uh yeah, I can send it to anybody if anybody's asking. But yeah, it's 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 possible to find it in the Facebook groups, like uh, nice. through recommendations. And we also met other travelers through. Uh, everybody ends up in Laos. Or most people ends up in Laos after China from Mongolia, or if people do it, obviously the other way around. But from Europe, you end up in in Laos, and you meet a lot of other people who were going through China at the same time, but obviously on other routes with other companies. And a lot of, well, some of them were complaining that they didn't get what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They didn't actually go through those routes that they agreed to or, you know, those kind of things. And we, we didn't have a single issue or problem. And our group worked really well as well. So other groups, it's again, you are sort of locked in for 40 odd days with other travelers. Many, many times that works out. Sometimes it doesn't. Ours was just like a dream team. Yeah, so it was really good. Yeah. That's wonderful. So you, did you plan out the entire route and plan out where you wanted to camp or which villages you wanted to go and mm. then gave it to the guide or did they have some mm. input? Roughly the, the, uh, the provinces. So okay. Only yeah. the provinces. And you can choose your own adventure, sort of. Sort of, you can, yeah. yeah. And then if you want to go through Tibet province, that's an additional few permits and stuff. Gotcha. Um, with the guide, spending so much time with the guide, were there um, things that you learned about China, like politically or just what the life is like for the local people or anything food related yeah, that you, lot, that was in yeah, particularly I interesting? Yeah. yeah, so things like, again, you know, these things spread among travelers or future travelers like, oh, you have to have a guide in China. He must be a spy who will then report on you to the government in some ways. And it's like, it's total BS. You know, it's not. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. No, that's, that's what, that's what we, we actually are. So are you reporting? <laughs> oh, it was a joke by then because yeah. we got to know oh, okay. it, 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 it was, uh, it was, uh, we, we became yeah, really good friends yeah. by then. But so we could actually ask these kind of silly questions. And he laughed. So yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that was a good sign. And he said no, he wasn't. <laughs> but uh, but then so things like that. And also when we went through the uh, the smaller uh, or yeah very tiny villages, but in like the Tibetan culture um, areas, he told us a lot of information about how they live and what they do and how they bury their dead or how uh, what or, or for example food we were all really interested in food because yes. it was fantastic there's n i mean i've been to a lot of chinese places around the world a lot but it doesn't it's not the same i don't know why but it's 
What were these dishes you were having? What were I they don't know the names. Of? I mean, they were a lot of them were vegetable based, okay. yeah, fruit, my, uh, my plant favorite, based. Yeah, sorry, my favorite was the pak <laughs> choy, and I'm so happy that in Canada I can buy pak choy anywhere, <laughs> anywhere. So we always yeah. have some pak choy in our freeze. So that was my favorite, and also broccoli with some mushrooms in you know oyster sauce, uh, and we had. Um, that was another famous Chinese di Chinese dish. Uh, so eggs with some tomatoes, and they put it on pasta and also on the top of the rice. So the, you can eat it with pasta or rice, whatever you like. So that was um, these were my favorites, and also we ate Beijing duck. Uh, is it Beijing duck? Uh, yeah, Beijing duck. Yeah. Yeah, Beijing duck. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> but it's uh, like the smallest place is like just on the side of the road. Let's say we drove for three hours and it's lunchtime, and we are in the mountains somewhere. It is a not even a village, just like a shack. You can go inside and and order, and it doesn't even look clean or anything. But then we would order, and the food was fantastic. Every single time we've stopped in one of these dodgy places, uh, and so I I was obsessed with food there. As so I was at lunch, I was waiting for dinner and dinner for. Wow. Lunch, yeah. yeah, and sometimes the uh, owner of the restaurant uh, restaurant allowed me to go back uh, to the kitchen and have a look at the fridge and just decide what we would like to eat. I mean, we could pick our vegetables and our meat. Yeah, but thanks to our guides because uh, or our guide because uh, she and he was really. Uh, kind to us and uh, they just wanted to make sure that we have a very good time in China so they always asked the owners of the restaurants uh, that we could go you know to the kitchen and have a look around and and to decide what we would like to eat what a cool experience yeah yeah and also they were really open-minded about uh, white camping because what we heard from other groups that the guide was really strict about you know about camping so they couldn't camp or they had to go to uh, touristic hotels so they spent a fortune on yeah. the hotels yeah but our guides just are took their just own was, were yeah. amazing yeah sorry <laughs> yeah they had their own tent with them so they yeah. like we camped all together in like in really like the Tibetan plateau or at least a, a similar area and uh, yeah when we were lucky to go through the the remote or for us it seemed remote parts of China yeah nice what were some cultural experiences that you had that changed the way that you see the world anywhere in that whole trip it doesn't have to be China it could be anything very very deep question i have to think <laughs> oh, very, i have to think about it uh but in, i think it's more like in general like for example how careful we need to be with our resources and it's um so that's not not necessarily a cultural thing but mm. on the other hand uh we see now waste everywhere like we went through china there's oh not china but like the whole of asia and it's just and it's not just there but uh talking of this trip there's garbage everywhere and the beaches are in a really bad shape so it was an eye-opening kind of uh, a trip i guess to how how careful we need to be with this planet right now because it could be too late and it's it's a cliche because this comes from everywhere now tv radio whatever podcast whatever mm -hmm. whatever you're reading it's all about that now and people may get bored of this but it's so true it's so true so that's uh yeah i mean Again, another thing is that we learned is that we, and maybe now talking of cultures, the local people are always really nice and, and maybe on a bigger scale of things, politics ruins everything. Mm -hmm. And that could be true for Iran. We went through Iran in 2014. The most fantastic people in the world are Iranians. Or like uh, went through uh, places where, where I think generally people wouldn't choose as a as a travel destination necessarily like kazakhstan we met fantastic people in kazakhstan they are very very welcoming um and and just in general how local people live wherever you go like where you go very far 
people go to like kids go to school people go to work parents pick them up and it's life goes on and maybe they are i don't know uh half as rich as the western world but life is normal life is totally fine and i think that's uh, that's that's something that we learned or like parts of southeast asia they used to be poor now it's kind of very developed thailand and malaysian places like that and and then just talking about generally about resources and stuff you learn how to be resourceful with water very much or electricity actually because yeah. like do you run out of electricity or your battery is going to last until the morning or or your food's going to go off because the fridge stops working or mm. or you run out of water and you kind of drink in the morning things like that and you just care for and back home i think we're used to turning the tap on and take it for granted and yeah. definitely yeah. and so it's you're re- rewiring your brain yeah. to we, use only what you have because you don't know when and we, it was funny we met uh, we met a canadian uh, girl who uh, they were with the whole family they were traveling through to all the way to malaysia and then back uh, with a camper van and she said she went back to because we met them like a year later as well uh, in europe so she said she she went back to the office to work same job she went back to and then she was standing around in the in the office kitchen or whatever and somebody was opening the fridge and then talking to her and just like leaving the fridge open and she closed the fridge because she got annoyed with the fridge being open <laughs> yeah because you're really careful with like your that's yeah. you got a small fridge and it's running off of the batteries and, and like you don't want to lose the, the, the coldness of the, the fridge yes. just careful i remember closing a, a, the faucet on somebody else like you had it run and it running water i'm like you're not, using, you're not using that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember coming back and doing dishes by hand with hot water and it being like this big deal. And I was all, I would be obsessed with washing dishes from then on. <laughs> and people are like, just put it in the dishwasher. I'm like, but I have hot water and soap. This is so amazing. Like it was weird, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, it changes you. What was the most hilarious thing that happened during your Budapest to Singapore trip? What do you think? There was, there was a few funny things happened. Uh, yeah, so we met um, a Russian family in Kazakhstan uh, next to a campsite, and we were just decided to park close to the, uh, the buildings there. And they were like, you know, weekend cottages. And uh, one of the, um, the Russian family invited us to their cottage to have a dinner together but we couldn't or we cannot speak russian and they cannot uh, they couldn't speak english so we had a whole night together having a really good time together but we were speaking um via the google translator all night yeah it was fantastic and also in mongolia um we went through a national park and uh there was a really, really flooded area. So we just decided, let's, you know, um, take a, a turn. and Or go around it. Like uh, uh, yeah. The field next to it looked better than the road, which is like a track, really. It's not a road. Yeah, and it turned out it was horse poo. <laughs> the, the whole yeah, area. Yeah, the whole area. And, and it the... just sank. Really. Oh, no. just yeah, sank. the whole truck just like <laughs> just sat in in the whole puddle of, of, of horse manure. And we we stepped out of the car and we sank until like mid thighs. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I lost my flip flops there, and they are still there. <laughs> yeah. So it was pretty difficult to recover the truck from there, but we were like, we were covered in crap, really. <laughs> and we were, we didn't know what to do. It was it took us like two hours until the first Land Cruiser that was big enough to pull us out uh, arrived. So we were sitting there a little bit like sort of like like in a not not in a level way and we're like how are we gonna even sleep here if we like we are covered in this thing and what are we gonna do now yeah. and then obviously you end up in situations like this and it always resolves itself somehow but yeah but like i think the most hilarious story that we have from that trip and it's not it's not our story but we heard it from the person that happened with this when the this girl who was riding her 
motorcycle from Switzerland to Mongolia and she stopped in some dodgy motel in uh, Kazakhstan and there was this person knocking on her door during the night and then when she opened the door there was this guy standing with a gun and when the guy sees her he says oh sorry wrong door <laughs> oh no <laughs> and, he oh asked, and he asked her out the next day. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> for a date. It, yeah. was, it was pretty funny. Yeah. She's like, maybe yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love it. So you guys are now in Canada with your Yep. And so you finished up your your Singapore trip, and then what did you have? A couple, few years at home. Getting... We went to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just for a wedding. <laughs> yeah. No, we went. We had this little road trip in Australia. We it wasn't a it wasn't necessarily an overlanding trip, but it, but it was a massive. Like, it was a longish uh, road trip on the east coast of Australia, and it was connected. Uh, the The main purpose of going there was actually a very good friend of mine's wedding, and then we done obviously a little two three weeks yeah. trip there and then i think that was the you know, last trip since like after that the world has changed so yes, the world has so changed. we've done yeah. that and then we already knew like let's buy a van come back to australia or let's uh, bring our prado back to australia or something like that but then obviously all those plans went out the window and then we are here now because now we can travel again right so. i was gonna say so you you have this van and you shipped from Germany to Halifax in yep. Canada. Yeah. How did you decide that the Pan American Highway was next for you? Uh, we wanted something as big as the Budapest mm-hmm. Singapore trip, and then there is there is two options. We either drive through Africa, or we do this, the Pan American. And the Pan American, obviously, we've done a bit of Africa already, so let's do something else mm-hmm. so that's how we ended up in the, in the pan american and i think it's bigger as well like in terms of like length and and um i don't know i've been to south america before and i, I just know i want to go back so i i want to do that and i've never been to central america and evelyn's never been on on the american continent yeah, so all, yeah. so it's all was like the the sort of uh i don't know the the scale was tipping towards mm-hmm. the americas and uh, yeah, I mean, we we are really overwhelmed with what we've seen in the last four weeks already. So I don't know what this next uh, year and five month brings, if that's how it long is going to be. I don't know. So you've come from the Maritimes of, in Canada across the country. Yep. And uh, you're actually getting close to the western side. So you've made it almost all the way across, actually, which is is great. Um, what are some? You've never been to North America before. No, never. And what if what what is it like? Like, did you have preconceived notions of what it would be like here? Are there weird things that you're like, why is this like this? What what's surprising? Yeah. So it may sound silly, but I just told friends that everything is like in the movies. So. <laughs> 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 you know this big milk in the in the supermarket <laughs> yes. and this just little things process. little details uh, seemed very <laughs> funny or strange to Evelyn yeah I yeah and also the scenery and uh, you know this 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 proper camp sites yeah just like in the movies so I, for me it's just wonderful yeah yeah nice. I, I like I, I love Canada especially the people here they are so friendly they are really I don't know, chat, chatty with us, they are really friendly and always ask us, how do we feel ourselves here? Do we have a good time here? They also invite us to their field to stay there, I mean, to their uh, garden or, or to, to their house to stay there, yeah, so, and, and they are very helpful as well, so. I'm glad to hear that as a Canadian. I'm always like, oh, I hope they're having a good time. (laughs) Oh, brilliant. Yeah, That's great. So you're going to head up to northern. So, yeah, so we're near Banff now. We're going to head to Alaska, towards Alaska, and we're going to, yeah, discover northwestern side of Canada as well. A bit of Alaska. Now we know we're probably not going to go to Tuck, (laughs) uh, which is fine. 
I think. I think the only reason why we would have gone to or the main reason we would have gone to Turkey is just to be able to say that we went to the northern coast. <laughs> so we can say that we went to the Arctic. Uh, we we're gonna go north enough, I think. And it's not the point is not to be able to say something important is to have a you know enjoy our trip and discover whatever we want to discover. And we're gonna go into Alaska, and then we turn around and start heading south. And um, I've never I spent a bit of time in on the on the east coast of the US but never been on the west coast or on the western side so that's going to be really great and going into those you know the best the southwest of the US really looking forward to that and I've never been south of the US in central america only to south america so there are one or two questions that I usually ask on every podcast and in this one I'm going to ask you if you could choose any country in the whole world to go to right now, where would you go and why? You go first. Oh, it's hard to choose. Um, I would say Chile, because I have never been there, but I saw some pictures on the internet and I also heard stories from other overlanders that it's just a beautiful country, so diverse, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to see it in person. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would say Chile, but also Peru. Oh. So, yeah. you, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's hard to choose, really. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I had these twenty seconds to think about it, but I don't have a good answer <laughs> because there's too many options. There's too many. I mean, I guess the reason why we're here because this was our choice to be here. So that's mm. why we're here. I mean. Right now, I don't want to be anywhere else. Ah, I want to. I want to. <laughs> yeah, I want to see what's you know north of here. I want to see what's there. But then you know we were looking through the, we went through the, the plans of where we can go and based on your advice where we could, be in Central and South America and all those places. And I said like we, I, I, I cannot wait to, to be around there. But then I don't want to wish this trip away in yes. terms of like you know like, okay like that that place can wait and we see what's here and be in the moment yeah yeah, yeah. But soak it all in because you never yeah. know when you're going to be back That's yeah and yeah. then uh, people are going to ask which was which part was the highlight of the trip and i will won't have an answer for that because i don't have an answer for the budapest singapore trip either or the budapest africa trip or i just cannot choose because there are too many good places to see and i think we've seen a big part of the planet but still very little. Yeah. There's still too much to see. If people want to find you online, where should they go? I know your website is very, very thorough and has a lot of resources and a lot of time has been put into it. So yeah, let us know where we can find you. Yeah, the website is overlandsite.com, as in S-I-T-E, overlandsite.com. And of course the Instagram, which is overlandsite underscore com. And we're trying to build a YouTube channel now. Uh, we have a lot of footage from our earlier trips as well that I just never had the energy to edit together or like create the, the, the stories, uh, which I will, I promise. But now, right now we're building or, or creating the videos about this trip. So pretty much as we go, pretty much live so in a way. Nice. Well, thank you. Same babe. name for the YouTube channel, of course. Same name for the YouTube channel. Perfect. Um, thank you guys so much for being guests on the Overland Journal podcast. I so appreciate you sharing your experiences and all the funny things that happen, your goals and everything. So thank you for having me as a guest in your Aveco. And uh, we are really excited to follow your journey south. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really. <laughs> thank you so much to all of the Overland Journal listeners and subscribers for tuning into this episode. And we will catch you next time. Bye.